Yo, what's going on, everybody? It is your boy Fitzmonk TV here, aka Glorn33. I'm back here today with another video on the channel for y'all today, and I'm back here with a bonus segment of the Legit Shoot Podcast. Here today, we're gonna be looking back at Sasha Banks's reign as the SmackDown Women Champion, and I'm gonna be answering the question: Who is the greatest SmackDown Women's Champion of all time, right? Now, I'm recording this on May 28th, 2021. Bianca Belair is currently the SmackDown Women's Champion. Uh, but, you know, with Extreme Rules, or not Extreme Rules, with Hell in a Cell and Money in the Bank and SummerSlam coming up, things could change. And I'm going to be honest with you guys. I think Sasha Minx is most likely going to regain that SmackDown Women's Championship sometime in the next year. It could be at SummerSlam. It could be at Money in the Bank. It could be at WrestleMania. But I do think she will be once again SmackDown Women's Champion at some point in the near future. But I want to focus on her current reign as the Smack or her last reign as SmackDown Women's Champion and compare it to some of the other SmackDown Women's Championship reigns of all time. For you guys who are not uh familiar with the uh with a bonus segment of the legit shoot podcast these are segments where i just talk about a certain topic and you know i give my opinion on it in a more expanded form in a it's basically it's me talking about something in a separate video instead of a normal smackdown raw you know pay-per-view review right so we're just going to be focusing on sasha banks and her SmackDown Women's Championship reign in this video. And hopefully you guys enjoy. Make sure to give me your thoughts in the comment section down below. Who you guys think is the greatest SmackDown Women's Champion of all time. And, you know, let's have a good conversation about this, right? So, let's get straight into it. So, Sasha won the SmackDown Women's Championship at Hell in a Cell last year in a brilliant match with Bayley. And then she held on to that title for six months. And she dropped it to Bianca Belair at wrestlemania last month last april and uh basically let's look at how the rain started right so there's some people and even me personally i kind of believe sasha and bailey should have been saved for wrestlemania should have been saved for wrestlemania uh this year but instead they decided to do the story you know with no fans in the thunderdome and the story still worked out it, you know, they had Bailey uh, end her friendship with Sasha after they couldn't regain the tag team titles. And there was a lot of people wondering, you know, would Sasha be the face or would Bailey be the face, right? You know, but they decided to do opposite of what they did with their NXT match in 2015 when Sasha was the heel and Bailey was the face. Instead, they had Sasha be the hero uh, this time in the story. And I had no problem with that, right? Because as great as Bailey's reign as SmackDown Women's Champion was, and we'll you know, uh, we'll talk about Bailey and some of the other SmackDown Women's Championship reigns a little bit later, right? As great as Bailey's reign was, everybody knew that the end game of Bailey's reign was gonna be her dropping that title to Sasha eventually, right? No matter if it was, because originally if there was no COVID, it would have been SummerSlam last year in Boston in Sasha's hometown. But they moved it back because, you know, they were hoping to do the story with no fans. But, of course, as COVID progressed and people, you know, saw that it was going to be a long time before we could have fans back in arenas, right? They decided just to, you know, do it in the Thunderdome, you know, and they thought doing it now was better than waiting to do it later. And it ended up working out. The match with Sasha and Bayley was fantastic. Everything, you know, that happened between Bailey and Sasha during Bailey's one-year title reign had led to that moment, right? Them being on all three shows, being the best thing on WWE television as, you know, a two-woman power duo. Them holding the tag titles, Sasha holding the Raw Women's title for a little bit, while Bailey, you know, had her dominance as the SmackDown Women's Champion. And then, Bayley, and then eventually, you know, it leading to the breakup to that fantastic match at Hell in a Cell. You know, the only thing you could say bad about that Hell in a Cell match is that it took place in the Thunderdome with no fans. How much better would that match have been if there was fans in the arena? Because that match is fantastic. It's one of my favorite Hell in a Cell matches ever. I don't think it's the best Hell in a Cell match, right? I don't think it's on the level of an Undertaker or Shawn Michaels or, you know, Undertaker McFoley and some of the other great Hell in a Cell matches we've seen. But it's a fantastic match. Fantastic. 
You know, my opinion would probably be different if there were fans in the arena for that match. But there weren't. That's just the reality of the situation. Sasha's reign could not have started on a better foot than having that match with Bailey. It was a thing. It was a great story. It was a great match. You know, the fact that Sasha and Bailey, has, you know, Sasha had the white, uh, Bailey had the, the black ring gear signifying and, you know, being a callback to good versus evil, Undertaker versus HBK from WrestleMania 25, a decade prior. Like, it, it, like what else could you have said? And everyone knew Sasha was going to be the one to take that town from Bailey, and they did it in spectacular fashion. So Sasha's reign gets started. You know, and Sasha cuts a great promo right after the match, talking about how she wants to go up and down that ring with Ruby Riots, the Liv Morgans, you know, the Taminas, the Natalias. Because I've said this before, one of the best things about Sasha Banks, and one of the things that make me believe that she's the best female wrestler of all time, is you look at most of the people she's wrestled. From Ronda Rousey, the Becky Lynch, the Charlotte, the Bailey, to Alexa Bliss, to Carmella. The list goes on. Most of the, the freaking Nia Jax. You know, to most of the people that Sasha has wrestled, those are those superstars' best matches. If you were to ask those superstars, who were your best match against? Most of them would say Sasha Banks. And I think a lot of fans would say the same thing. Because that's how good Sasha is. It doesn't matter who you put her in the ring against. She always comes out making herself and the person she was in the ring with, better. Because she's that damn good. She sleeps, breathes, and eats professional wrestling. That's what got me so excited for her reign. I'm just like, finally, they're going to do what they should have been doing with Sasha for years. Just letting her go wrestle everybody on the roster and show them why she's better than everybody. Put on classics with all these names. That was the, that was the big thing I, I, I thought that we could do with for Rain. And coming out of every match and every feud and every angle, you know, she's going to come out looking more like a dominant champion, more like a bigger star, like the star she is, because she's one of the top stars in that company. And then the people she wrestles, they're going to be taken more seriously at the end of the day because of how Sasha elevating that, how Sasha elevated them in defeat, right? So Sasha's reign gets started, and the first thing they do, they do a rematch with Bailey on a SmackDown. I think it was the, the second SmackDown after Hell in a Cell, right? And I don't remember if there was a lead-in to that match, right, from an NFL game or anything, but I do remember that match, and that's, you know, those first 30 minutes, because that match took off a good 30 to 40 minutes of the first hour of SmackDown that night. I remember that being one of the highest rated segments, one of the highest rated matches on SmackDown for, you know, uh, in a couple year span. I don't remember the specific stat, but it was super, super, super highly rated. Everybody was talking about it on social media because everybody was watching it. Almost everybody had saw how great the Hell in a Cell match was and everybody was excited for the rematch. And it was a damn good singles rematch. Really good stuff here with Sasha and Bayley. So we get the match, right? And the only thing that you could say that was bad about this rematch was that it had no fans. It took place in the Thunderdome. And it was two or three commercial breaks during the match. But the match itself was fantastic. Fantastic. And Sasha gets a clean win, basically ending her feud with Bailey for now. And we could sit here and debate that, you know, should Bailey have won the Royal Rumble or should they have waited and had Sasha win the Royal Rumble and then save the match and Sasha's big moment for WrestleMania, right? But they decided not to. And looking back at it, the feud was great. You know, they could have made changes to it, but all in all, the legacy of that feud will be long remembered, especially that Hell in a Cell match. Uh, and if you guys have forgotten it, I would, you know, highly recommend you guys go find that match on SmackDown and go watch it, you know, start the finish. It's great. It's great. Right. So after that, they the plan was for Sasha to go into a feud with Carmella. Carmella had just come back from injury and they had just thrown Carmella into this feud. You know, she was debuting a new gimmick. She was no longer doing the uh, fabulous gimmick anymore. She was doing this more... Uh, diva like gimmick that reminded a lot of people of something straight out of the divas era right and i wasn't with it i wasn't with the gimmick you know 
I didn't mind the Carmelo feud because first off, we all knew Sasha was not going to lose the title. You have this all the time in professional wrestling. You have, you know, uh, champions who, you know, need stuff to keep them busy during their championship reigns, right? You know, we call them filler feuds, basically. Things that, you know, make the champion look more dominant coming out of the, the feud and to help the challenger, but you know, make themselves in the bigger stars. And it helps the title, it helps the show, it, you know, it helps keep things going. Because WWE is a 365 product. Everyone knew that Carmelo was never going to take that title from Sasha. But it was a fun filler feud for the most part that I enjoyed. The first couple weeks, you know, Carmelo had just come back and I was frustrated that Carmelo had not done anything to even earn a championship match. Because she had just come back and she just attacked Sasha like three or four weeks in a row and they gave her the match. They didn't do a number one contenders match. They didn't do anything. And remember, Sasha had just done an interview talking about how she can't wait to wrestle everybody on, in that division. And instead, you're just giving Carmelo a championship opportunity just because he attacked Sasha. Not because she, you know, won a, uh, she had built up momentum by beating people on the SmackDown Women's roster. Not by winning a number one contenders match. They just gave her the matches because he had beat Sasha up before her matches. It was like, really? That's what we're doing? So before we could even get to the actual Carmella and Sasha match, we had a little bit of a uh, stop at Survivor Series. And Survivor Series last year was one of the worst builds for a Survivor Series ever. There was no stakes. You know, and no matter if it was the five-on-five traditional men's match or the women's match, there was no stakes. There was nothing. The tagline was best of the best, really. The best of SmackDown going up against the best of Raw. That's it. It was really nothing on the line but pride and bragging rights. They didn't have no NXT involved. They had no special reward for the winners. There was nothing. It was just best of the best. And even though you get some great stuff on that show, the build was very disappointing. We had Roman Reigns and Drew McIntyre in a fantastic uh, you know, class of the world champions. And we also had Sasha versus Asuka, which you can probably make an argument, most likely that Sasha and Asuka are the two best female wrestlers in the world. And remember, we had just seen Sasha and Asuka a couple months earlier because they had spent a couple months feuding during the summer over the Raw Women's and Tag Team titles when Sasha and Bayley were still together. So now here you have Asuka, still Raw Women's champion, and let's not talk about how disappointing her run as Raw Women's champion was, but... And here we have Sasha in the early stages who had put Asuka over multiple times and had never defeated Asuka clean on the main roster. So we got this really great technical wrestling match where Sasha and Asuka once again prove why they are the best in the women's division and Sasha pinned Asuka. I remember the finish where they were just trading roll-ups for like the last minute and a half and it was great and Sasha got the roll-up victory. Fantastic ending. Fantastic ending. Right, so now you have Sasha looking dominant. She had just, you know, defeated Bailey in a grueling Hell in a Cell match to win the title. She won her rematch against Bailey. Now she's beating Oscar clean, and I'm just like, this is the Sasha we should have ever, we should have always gotten, because the Sasha we had gotten up to that point on the main roster, she had she had never defended a singles title, because WWE would have her drop the wrong side of the Charlotte or Oscar nonsense. Plus her and Bailey. You know, lost the women's tag team titles before they really could even get started with their reign. And they, the thing that sucks is they dropped those titles to the Iconics at WrestleMania just for two years later for the Iconics. Both members, Peyton Royce and Billy Kay, now to no longer even be signed with the company. So, Sasha's booking up to that reign of SmackDown Women's Champion had always been frustrating eventually for crazy Sasha Banks fans and people who are loyal to her and the crew like me, you know? So, to see her finally getting that momentum that she always deserved, it was good to see. It was good to see. And it was going to be interesting to see if they could carry this over into the Carmella feud. Because like I said before, everyone knew that Carmella was not going to take that title from Sasha. Everyone already knew that. The thing about it is, it was like, okay, can Sasha and Carmella make a fun feud? And it's, the job's going to be more on Sasha because we all know Sasha's the bigger star. She's the better wrestler, etc. So we get the feud and then they introduce 
uh, this character Reginald into the equation, right? A guy from the Performance Center, not really a wrestler. He's there more as Carmelo's assistant. I think the name they gave him was Smothier, Smothier, something like that. You know, he was in charge of getting, you know, Carmelo champagne and wine and making it taste good, whatever, all this nonsense, right? So, uh, eventually we get the match, right, with Sasha and Carmella, and it is one of the most underrated TV, or, no, not TV, underrated pay-per-view matches of last year. Go back and watch the match. It is a great, great, great match. It's easily Carmella's best match in her WWE career, and it was a great title defense for Sasha. Because even though you didn't, you knew Sasha was not losing that title, right? There was m multiple moments in that match where you hesitated for a sec, for a second, and you're like, "Damn, Carmella could really pull this off." Carmella looked great here, and they had to do it because Carmella had not done anything up to that point to make you even deserve that she deserved to be SmackDown Women's Champion. She never won a number one contenders match. She never did anything. She just came back and they just threw her into this match with Sasha. And she delivered. People came out of it having more of a respect for Carmella because they were like, oh, Carmella can actually wrestle. She's not just another blonde, you know, with a good looking body that Vince, you know, gets horny about. Right? Carmella actually went in there and she showed out. She showed out. And Sasha did a great job of making Carmella look great even though Carmella lost. And that's what Sasha does. She elevates everybody that she steps in the ring with. It's a great match. And I would, you know, highly recommend you guys go back and see it if you guys haven't or forgotten how good the match is. It's not Sasha's greatest match ever. It's, it might not, it's probably not in her top 10, right? Because Sasha's list of great matches is endless at this point in her, in her career. But still, it's a great match. And I feel like you guys should go back and watch it if you guys have time. It's a great match. It's a great match. So, coming out of that, you know, you're, you, you're like, all right, are they going to give Sasha a new challenger after TLC? You know, a lot of people were saying maybe Natalia, because remember, you know, these are filler feuds for Sasha. We know that Sasha is not losing the title, you know, but you still need her to be a great champion. So, coming out of that great match with Carmella, you're like, what's next? And they decided to do another match with Carmella, which is, well, honestly, it was whatever. It was whatever. And uh, there was actually, during the build-up to the rematch at the Royal Rumble, they do a match with Sasha and Reginald on a random edition of SmackDown, which turned out to be a decent intergender match, which once again, you know, get, uh, plays to my point of how great Sasha is. The fact that she was able to turn an intergender match into something that wasn't horrific and was actually watchable and decent... This showcases how good Sasha is. The match should have never took place if we're being honest with ourselves. But for what the match was, it worked. Sasha made the match for Reginald work. And is once again another example of Sasha showing how great she is. So we get the match with Sasha and uh, Carmella. The rematch at the Royal Rumble. And the match isn't as good as their match at TLC. But it's still a good title defense for Sasha. I wasn't the biggest fan of the ring attire she was wearing that night, right? And, you know, the match is what it is. It's a good match. It's a decent match for a pay-per-view. But, you know, the, it doesn't really, you know, measure up to what Sasha and Carmella did at TLC. But it was a good title defense. You also got to remember here at the Royal Rumble, this is where Bianca Belair won the Women's Royal Rumble match. And what was a great Royal Rumble? It was a good show. You know, and Bianca's Royal Rumble victory was great. The issue was that the way Bianca was presented in the feud with Sasha was horrific, right? And, you know, we'll, we can basically get to that now because from basically from the Royal Rumble in January to WrestleMania, the focus was Sasha and Bianca. Sasha doesn't really get another major feud here. You know, she doesn't get a match with Natalia. She doesn't get the match with Ruby Riot or Liv Morgan or Chelsea Green or Mickey James. You know, all these matches we were hoping to see Sasha get to do as SmackDown Women's Champion to prove once again how great she is and elevate those superstars while also elevating the SmackDown Women's Championship. We don't get them. We don't get them. You know, because everyone knew that Bianca was going to choose Sasha as her opponent. 
They tried to tease Bianca going on Raw and her going after Asuka in the Raw Women's Championship, but we all knew the match was going to be her and Sasha, right? Two black African-American females in a WrestleMania main event. You know, two people on the level of Sasha and Bianca, especially with how big they are in, you know, WWE in terms of popularity and their fan bases. You know, everyone knew what was going to happen. And WWE did, even though WWE made Sasha and Bianca the focus coming out of WrestleMania, or not after WrestleMania, out of the Royal Rumble, the presentation and the booking of the feud was pure garbage. It was horrific. It was horrific. So, you know, because we had Elimination Chamber. And I believe there was only one Elimination Chamber match this year. And I think that was the, uh, the SmackDown Universal Championship number one contenders match with Daniel Bryan won. Why didn't Sasha defend that title inside the Elimination Chamber? I would, that's the match I wanted, her to see, I wanted to see. I wanted Sasha's reign to be a mix of one-on-one feuds, multi-man matches, you know, and good angles, good stories. I was hoping they would do a you know elimination chamber match with Sasha, Bailey. You could have done Carmella in there. You could have put Liv Morgan. You could have put Ruby Ryan, and if you you know maybe either Chelsea Green or somebody, you know, and then have Sasha successfully defend the title. So have her retain in a great chamber match because I feel like we all know she could put it on. You could have Sasha and Bailey be the final two, right? Or maybe have Sasha Carmella be the final two, you know, and then. Uh, have the match end with Sasha retaining, of course. But instead, going to the Elimination Chamber, they re- they randomly have Sasha Bianca challenge Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler for the Women's Tag Team Championships. And at this point, I'm just like, I'm not against it because we had seen Sasha Bianca tag team with each other on multiple occasions already, right? They tagged with each other during Tribute to the Troops. They tagged team together. Uh, they tagged together in a couple of other matches. And they were a good unit. You know, it did feel a little bit early for Sasha to have a new tag team mar- partner. Especially, you know, her recently coming off, you know, the uh, the, the breakup with Bailey. But still, I, you know, it was like whatever. Because I personally thought that if Sasha and Bianca win the tag titles, okay. You know, Sasha's going to be a double champion, right? And you can tell the story going to WrestleMania you know, the same story you did with John Cena and HBK back in 2007 at WrestleMania 23, right? You know, was, uh, tag team partners facing each other for a world champion at WrestleMania. I thought they were going to do that with Sasha and Bianca, and that was the main reason why I didn't complain too much that we didn't get Sasha defending the title in the chamber or anything else like that. But instead, what do they do? They have Nia Jax pin Sasha clean. Clean at Elimination Chamber. You know, and I, they, you know, what they do here is they tell that, you know, distractions from Reginald is causing all the issues here and all this other nonsense. But, uh, but still, it's like, why is Reginald being the focal point here? And why is Sasha and Bianca losing? Sasha and Bianca should not be losing anything on the road to WrestleMania. You should, try, you should be trying to make them look like the biggest stars that they can possibly be. And I'm just like, what in the hell are we doing here? What's the point of doing this feud if you're not going to have Sasha and Bianca win the titles? You could have Sasha facing anybody else, getting a couple more successful title defenses under her belt. But instead, no, you're having her lose the freaking Nia Jax, one of the worst wrestlers in the company... Clean on pay-per-view. So coming out of it, they decide, oh, let's double down on it. Let's double down on it. Let's continue to make Reginald the focal point. Because, you know, every week Reginald's getting involved in Sasha and Bianca's business. And the main thing here is because Reginald has some kind of addiction or, you know, like he's attracted to Sasha. I don't know. And at points, they're teasing that Sasha Bianca could be, or not Sasha Bianca, Sasha and Reginald could be, you know, an on-screen pairing. I don't know. They, I don't know what, where, what the direction was, what they wanted to go here. But they decided to double down by booking Sasha and Bianca to, uh, to go up against Nia and Shayna for the tag titles again at Fastlane. And I'm like, okay. So they then went at Elimination Chamber. They're going to win the titles here. And that's how we're going to get, you know, Sasha Bianca going to WrestleMania, right? Instead, not only do they double down on the Reginald thing, 
right? They have Sasha and Bianca lose again. Clean. And I don't remember if it was Bianca. I believe it was Bianca who got pinned here. So Sasha got pinned the pay-per-view before, and now Bianca got pinned in this pay-per-view. And everyone's like, what the hell is the point of this? This is the part of Sasha's reign that gets me angry. Because you have Sasha, dude, you're talking about how she wants to wrestle everybody on the SmackDown Women's division. Instead, you're booking her in this nonsense with Bianca, with them challenging for the tag titles when you had no intention of ever having them win the tag titles. If you never had the intention of having Sasha and Bianca win the tag titles, what was the point of booking the feud to begin with? What was the point? There was no point. It's a waste of our time. I And I absolutely hate it. Because you could add Sasha elevating a, Lu, a, a Liv Morgan or a Ruby Riot, putting on an underrated match that steals the show. Because that's how good Sasha is. No, you decide to have them go after the tag titles in a complete waste of BS time. I absolutely hate that. You didn't have Sasha defend inside the Elimination Chamber. You didn't have her defend at Fastlane. Sasha went from Royal Rumble to a couple weeks before Mania not defending that title. And me, even though I'm a huge Sasha Banks fan, I'm sitting here like, I want to see her defend the title. I don't, I don't want to see her just hold the title for no reason. No, I want to see her defend the title. I want to see her have good storylines and great matches because that's what she's all about. And you're taking that away from me. Because at this point, you could see that most likely Bianca was going to beat Sasha at WrestleMania. Everyone knew that. Even though I talked on the podcast each and every single week saying how Bianca was not ready. And I, I believe, personally, I believe I've been proven right on that so far. You know, Bianca's push was Russ. And I still believe they should have waited till SummerSlam to have Bianca win that title. But that's not what this video is about. You know, you had Sasha slap the hell out of Bianca after they lost at Fastlane. And then Bianca sat there and did nothing. Bianca waited till a whole week later to get payback on Sasha with a slap of her own. I'm just like, really? The Bianca and NXT would have never let that happen to begin with. But now you're gonna have Bianca play pussy on the main roster. This was this is why this is the part that devalues Sasha's reign as champion. Because they really messed up. They were really messed up here. Instead of having Sasha defend the title and you know look more dominant going into the match with Bianca, they decide to waste their time having them you know go after the tag titles for two months. Two months. Where Sasha did not defend the SmackDown Women's Championship at all. She wasted her time going after those tag titles for two months with Bianca. And it led to absolutely nothing. It was a waste of time. And it made the book. Or not the book. It made the build to Sasha and Bianca at WrestleMania look worse. Because they focused on having them lose those two tag title matches. And they made the focus about Reginald's relationship with Sasha. When it should have never been about any of that. If you never had the plan to make Sasha and Bianca the women's tag team champions, you should have never done the match to, to begin with. You should have had Bianca feud with Carmella for about a month and a half before starting the feud with Sasha, and you should have had Sasha defend inside the Elimination Chamber and face somebody else at Fastlane. Could have been Sonya Deville, Ruby Riot, Liv Morgan. You guys get my point. You guys get my point. So, coming out of... Uh, Coming out of Fastlane, they finally decide, all right, let's do the focus of Sasha Bianca, right? The last two, three weeks, they finally have Sasha Bianca focus on, you know, uh, building up their match at WrestleMania. And in between that time, we get a match between Sasha and Nia Jax for the SmackDown Women's Championship, which is pretty decent. You know, it was to get Sasha one more title defense before WrestleMania, and it was a decent match. Because Sasha Banks is probably the only person in that company that can bring Nia Jax to a good match. Because Nia Jax not only sucks in the ring, but she sucks as a performer. That's just the honest truth. She's not good. The fact that Sasha is the only person that can bring Nia Jax to a good match, this shows once again what they should have been doing with Sasha the entire time as SmackDown Women's Champion. 
elevating other people. Elevating other people. But going into the match with Bianca, the story wasn't there, right? It was more the spectacle of the match because everyone was excited to see these two uh, go at it. It was, it was a dream match for so long for so many people. And now you're getting it on the biggest stage at WrestleMania, despite how bad the build was. And to put the cherry on top, it was in the main event of night one. So added pressure, right, for them to deliver. And now, you know, you get Sasha and Bianca and they absolutely tear the house down. Great match. Fantastic. I don't have to tell you guys how great that match is. Let's go back and watch it on Peacock, right? Bianca freaking uh, deadlifting Sasha into the ring, right? Sasha's 720 Tornado DDT. So many great spots, you know? The ending with the hair whip. Where you could legit hear that throughout the entire state of Florida. And then, you know, Bianca's KOD, even though we all know Michael Cole botched it. But, you know, it, it is kind of, it's, it's sad that he did botch that. Right? And no matter how much I can complain about the booking and how Bianca was presented going into that match, I, I can't deny that it's a great match. Plus, I always think about, you know, that video of Sasha, you know, uh, outside the ring smiling as Bianca is celebrating because you see that the camera's not on Sasha. She's not in character at that moment. At that moment, Sasha is Mercedes Renaro. She's as proud of the moment that she just created that will live in people's minds forever as Bianca celebrates becoming a star in her own right. Even though I can complain about Bianca's presentation here, you know, for an hour and a half if I truly wanted to, but I'll spare you guys that. Right, that's why we do SmackDown reviews every week. You know, so then Sasha's reign ends at WrestleMania, you know, in a fantastic match. Even though, me personally, I believe Sasha should have held on to that title till SummerSlam. They should have gave Bianca more time to become more presentable in front of the WWE Universe. Have Sasha have more great title matches with the likes of other people on that SmackDown roster. And then, when Bianca was fully ready to take that title, have Bianca take that title from Sasha at SummerSlam, and then have Bianca go on to hold that title all the way to WrestleMania next year. WrestleMania 38, which will be in Dallas, I believe. Right? That's the way I think they should have done that. They didn't, but it is what it is. So, at the end, how does Sasha's six, uh, six months as SmackDown Women's Champion, how did this, does that measure... To everybody else, right? How does that measure to the other SmackDown Women's Champion? Well, I'll say this. Sasha's reign was good. It could have been a lot better. Mainly if, you know, you had had Sasha defend the title in between the Royal Rumble and a couple weeks before WrestleMania. Sasha should have defended that title at Elimination Chamber. And you should have never done Sasha Bianca as a tag team going after the women's tag titles if you never had the idea of having them win the tag titles. If you did, no problem. Because I would have loved to see Sasha walk into WrestleMania as a double champion. I would have loved to see them do the John Cena and HBK storyline. I would have loved to see it. But they messed up. They put so much focus on that clown Reginald and having them lose the Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler that it ended up hurting Bianca's presentation and it ended up hurting Sasha's reign. It didn't hurt Sasha as a character, but it did hurt her reign. So that's the big downfall. But if you look at it, the matches with Bailey, the match with Asuka, the matches with Carmella, and especially the match with Bianca to end her reign were great. Those are about five or six great, really, really good Sasha matches during the, that reign. And you look back at that, and if you measure that resume of matches against some of the other champions who have held the SmackDown Women's title since its inception in 2016, it's hard to dispute that even though Sasha held that title for six months, that she's not arguably the greatest SmackDown Women's champion of all time. I'll give you guys my answer here if I truly believe that here in a sec. So I have it pulled up right here. I have a list of everybody that's ever held... Uh, the SmackDown Women's Championship since 2016. There have been 19 reigns uh, with the SmackDown Women's Championship. Not 19 champions. Uh, 19 reigns, right? Bianca is currently the 19th reign, you know, as she's, you know, doing her uh, championship reign as we speak. There's been 10 champions. So those 10 champions are Bailey, Becky, Charlotte, Sasha, Naomi, Carmella, 
Alexa Bliss, Oscar, Natalia, and Bianca Belair. So let's go through the champions, right? Becky held that title. Uh, Becky first won the title back at Backlash 2016 when the championship was created. Then Alexa Bliss won that title in 2016 a couple months later. Naomi won the title uh, at Elimination Chamber, but then had to vacate the title because of a knee injury, and Alexa Bliss regained that title that same night. Naomi would return to regain her title in her hometown of Orlando at WrestleMania 33. She would go on to hold that title till SummerSlam, where Natalya would beat her, and then Charlotte would win that title in her hometown of North Carolina a couple months later. Then Carmella cashed in the money to break briefcase to take the town from Charlotte a couple uh, a couple of nights after WrestleMania 34. Charlotte would regain the title later in the year at SummerSlam in that triple threat match where we get Becky's epic heel turn. Then uh, Becky as a heel would win the title a month later at Hell in a Cell. Then Asuka would win the title in a fantastic triple threat match to end the year at TLC 2018, where Ronda cost both Becky and Charlotte the championship. Charlotte would win the title two weeks before WrestleMania 35 uh, by taking the title from Oscar, which pisses me off to this, to this day. Becky would gain the title when we all know, of course, in the first ever women's WrestleMania main event, Becky uh, won both the Raw and SmackDown women's title in the winner-take-all match against Ronda and Charlotte. Even though that match does not compare to the greatness of Sasha and Bianca for WrestleMania last month. Charlotte would win the title again uh, for a fourth time a month later at Money in the Bank. She would only hold on to that title for less than 10 minutes because Bailey would cash in her Money in the Bank briefcase. And she would win the title as a babyface. Charlotte would regain the title again a couple months later at uh, Hell in a Cell. And then she would only hold that title for five days where Bailey would regain the title when Bailey had her epic heel turn on SmackDown, destroying the Bailey inflatables and all of that good stuff. Then one year later, Sasha would win the match uh, at Hell in a Cell to start her reign as champion. And of course, you know, uh, Bianca won the title a little over a month ago when she beat Sasha at WrestleMania. So those are your champions. So... So, I'm not going to rank all of, actually, yeah, why not? Why not? Why not? I was, you know, since there's only 10 of them, I will rank, this, in my opinion, the greatest SmackDown Women's Champion of all time, right? I'm going to put Bianca at the bottom just because she's in her first reign right now. It's not fair to rank Bianca. You know, when she's only been champion for about 30 days, even though I complain about Bianca's presentation every single week on this podcast, right? I can't, we can't really, uh, we can't really gauge Bianca's, you know, legacy as SmackDown Women's Champion when her reign's not even over yet. Plus, she just won that title. So, whenever Bianca loses that title, no matter if it's to Sasha Banks at SummerSlam or Becky Lynch or somebody else, or at WrestleMania next year, or whenever, right, then it'll, maybe we'll revisit this list, and then we'll see where Bianca stacks up. But I'll put her at number 10 with an asterisk just because, you know, it's too early to tell with her. At number 9, I would probably put uh, Natalia, just because I don't really remember anything from Natalia's reign. She held that title for three months, and I don't remember anything from it. At number 8, I would put Carmella, most... Yeah, I would put Carmella, right? I, you know, Carmella did hold the title for about five months, you know, but she was very annoying during that time. Her character as a heel, she would just be screaming most of the time. And, like, they did have her beat Asuka and Charlotte a couple times, you know, before Charlotte eventually took that title from her at SummerSlam. But still, you know, Carmella's reign, it's just not it for me. Too much screaming, and she as a heel, it just wasn't it. it. Wasn't my thing. So at number seven, I would probably put Alexa Bliss, right? I don't even really remember much from Alexa's reign. You know, Alexa held that title twice. I remember nothing from those two reigns. Nothing. Uh, at number whatever we got number seven now. Uh, at six. 
Yeah, at six, I would put Naomi, right? Naomi had two reigns with those titles. I don't remember much from them, but, you know, I, I definitely want to see Naomi again as a women's champion one day. You know, maybe one day Naomi will be SmackDown Women's Champion or Raw Women's Champion. Uh, you know, I, I, he's definitely one of the most underrated in that company, in my opinion. You know, I don't like I said, I don't remember much from Naomi's reign, but it's definitely better than the ones I've already listed. So she'll slide into that number six spot. At number five, I'll, I got to put Asuka. Asuka had one reign. He held that title for three months. And, and what I remember from Asuka's reign is her victory. I remember her victory uh, when she won at TLC. The fantastic rematch they did with Oscar versus Becky at the Royal Rumble. Remember, they did Oscar versus Becky two years in a row at the Royal Rumble. Both those matches are great, you know. But the match they had for the SmackDown Women's Championship may be better than the one they had uh, the year uh, the year after for the Raw Women's Championship. That that you know that night you know Becky losing the Oscar in the fashion that she did and then entering the Women's Royal Rumble later on in the night and winning it, great stuff there, great stuff there. But other than that, I don't remember anything else from Oscar's reign. And what's even more disappointing is Oscar didn't get the chance to go into WrestleMania and defend the SmackDown Women's Title. She didn't get that opportunity. Instead, they gave it to Charlotte. Two weeks before WrestleMania 35, and Asuka ended up on the pre-show. Charlotte never deserved to be in that triple threat match uh, with Becky and Ronda. You know, Becky versus Ronda should have been the main event of WrestleMania 35 in a singles match. Why do you think we still get all these rumors every single day that WWE wants to do Ronda versus Becky next year at Mania? Or the year after in Hollywood? The match is going to take place at some point. Ronda's going to come back. Becky could come back any day now. So, clearly that match is going to happen. Right? But they they had two chances to do it. Becky had her nose broken. So, they couldn't have done it at that time at Survivor Series 2018. And instead, they decided, oh, we have to put Charlotte in there. Even though Charlotte never deserved to be in that match at WrestleMania 35. So, it's disappointing that, you know, that hurts Asuka's reign and where Asuka is on this list. Because Asuka could be a little bit higher. But, you know, Asuka's reign ended way pre- prematurely. And she should have had the opportunity to defend the SmackDown Women's title at WrestleMania 35. You know, so because of that, and because of the bad booking, especially with the end of that reign, Asuka's going to have to take the number fifth position. Right? Charlotte's going to come in at number four, just because she's a five-time, 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 five-time. Right? Just because he's a five-time SmackDown Women's Champion doesn't mean she gets to be in the top three. I would ask you guys right now, and a lot of you guys know I'm not a big fan of Charlotte. I think she's the most overrated female uh, star in WWE history. I truly believe that, right? I would ask you guys, tell me right now, out of all five Charlotte's reigns, a SmackDown Women's Champion, mind you, those reigns are combined 193 days. So Sasha's one reign as SmackDown Women's Champion, which comes in at 167 days, is only is 27 days shorter than all of Charlotte's five reigns as SmackDown Women's Champion combined. Out of those five reigns that Charlotte had, that only combined up to 193 days, are any of those memorable to you? I would ask you guys, really, for those of you guys who like to call Charlotte the GOAT, are any of those reigns memorable to you? Do you remember anything from those title reigns? The only one that you can argue that you, I remember is uh, her longest one. The one where she held the title for 147 days when she beat Natalia on a random edition of SmackDown in her hometown. And she held that title to a little bit after WrestleMania when Carmella t- took the title off her. So, like, let me know. Let me know. Right? Because... From that reign, all I remember is Charlotte having a decent match with uh, with Alexa Bliss at Survivor Series. I don't remember anything else from that reign. I think she had a match with Ruby Riot at Fastlane. Like, I could be wrong. And then uh, her uh, her beating Asuka at WrestleMania 34. And mind you, like Charlotte's all is always has something to do with the bad booking in Asuka's career. Charlotte always has something to do with that. 
And Charlotte should have never beat Oscar at the WrestleMania 34. Charlotte should have never been the one put in position to end Oscar's undefeated streak. Oscar should have beat Charlotte at that WrestleMania and should have remained undefeated until Ronda Rousey came along to beat Oscar. That's what they should have done. That's what they should have done with, you know, Oscar's undefeated streak. Charlotte beating that streak, as great as that match was, it's a great match, right? The, the, the ending decision is horrific. And that's, you know, those two matches, right? Her beating, uh, or her versus Alexa Bliss at Survivor Series and the match with Oscar at WrestleMania is the only thing I remember from that ring. Plus, Carmella beating her, uh, you know, after casting in the Money in the Bank contract. Because I remember I was happy to see Carmella win the title, right? Because I've never been a fan of Charlotte. And I remember how uh, excited the crowd was, how massive the pop Carmella got when she cast in that briefcase, right? That's the only memorable, you know, or not even memorable, the only most notable reign Charlotte's had to smack the women's champion. The other reigns, you look at them. Uh, her second reign, right? When uh, she was put in that triple threat match with Carmella and Becky Lynch at SummerSlam later that year. Charlotte should have never won the title on that night. It should have been Becky Lynch versus Carmella one-on-one. And remember, Charlotte gets booed out of the building after winning that match. And then when Becky Lynch turns heel after the match, everybody is, is, is elated. And even though Becky, no one wanted Becky to remain heel full time, it was frustration from the fans because they wanted to see Becky succeed. And Charlotte had always been put in that position to look better than Becky. And, it, and not just Becky, everybody else in the women's division. And people were sick and tired of it. They were sick and tired of it. Right? So, Charlotte only held that title for 28 days. And the only thing people remember f- from it is not Charlotte being champion, but how great Becky was in those two months that she was a heel. And then Becky winning the title at Hell in a Cell that year. No one cares about the reign. All we care about from that reign is Becky. That's it. The only thing you, the only word, that's, that's the word that describes Charlotte's second reign of SmackDown Women's Champion Becky. That's it. The beginning of the man character. And even though we can be mad that Charlotte won the title on that night, it actually worked out better for Becky Lynch in the long run because of the man character and everything, you know, that happened with Becky's career going after that. Charlotte's third reign, you know, when she uh, beat Oscar two weeks before WrestleMania. I've, I've already talked about that. That should have never happened. You know, Oscar should have went into that WrestleMania as champion. So another example of Charlotte's booking hurting Oscar's career. Charlotte's fourth reign, when she won the title a month after Becky won the title at WrestleMania 35. This was kind of predictable because, you know, you weren't going to have Becky stay double champion for long. It wasn't feasible to have her defend both the Raw and SmackDown Women's Championships on a consistent basis. And we all know that Becky went on to hold on to that title for a year afterwards, right? We all know what happened. So it didn't really mean much, you know? We, we still get the tagline of Becky two belts and the shirts and all that. But if Becky being a long-term double champion was never going to happen. Charlotte wins that title in, at Money in the Bank just to drop that title less than 10 minutes later to Bayley. So not an, no one remembers that reign. All people remember is Bayley cashing in 10 minutes later. And then finally, Charlotte's fifth reign as champion, the one that only lasted five days, Right, she won the title Hell in a Cell just so they could say, Charlotte's a 10 time women's champion. That was the only reason why Charlotte won that match because they wanted to put down Charlotte's resume. Because they want to make you believe by giving Charlotte all these accolades that you're going to just undisputed say, Oh, yeah, look at Charlotte's accomplishments. She deserves to be the greatest woman, you know, superstar of all time when she's not. She's not even in my top five personally. And I've done a video on that. You know, you guys know, go check out the why I think Sasha is the best female wrestler of all time video. Think if you guys want more information on why Charlotte's not in my top five, you know, uh, females of all time list. Go check that out. I'm not going to explain it here. But Charlotte, you know, only held that title for five days so that she could drop the title to Bailey, who had that epic heel turn. So I, I don't know really what else to, to tell you guys here. Look, you look at Charlotte's five reigns of SmackDown Women's Champion. None of them are memorable. 
The most notable one at 147 days was her, was her first one. And that reign isn't even that special. So just because Charles a five-time SmackDown Women's Champion, she's not even in the top three greatest SmackDown Women's Champions of all time, in my opinion. She's not. And she doesn't deserve to be. Sorry. That's just the reality of the situation, in my opinion, personally. So at number, going to the top three, right? I got Becky at number three. Becky was a three-time currently, yes, she's a three-time SmackDown Women's Champion. And all three of Becky's title victories are memorable. Becky won the inaugural SmackDown Women's Championship at Backlash September 11, 2016, right? When she was the last kicker, she was the best choice for the winning that title. In my opinion, Becky should have went on to hold on to that title all the way to WrestleMania, what was it, 33? Right? She should have went on the hold on to that title all the way to WrestleMania 33, but she didn't. She only held that title for about three months before dropping it to Alexa. Right? And she didn't really do much with that title during that time anyway. But this is more WWE's fault. Her second title victory when she beat uh, Charlotte, that's memorable because Becky, you know, she was heel at the time, but the fans were behind her. And you could see, go back and watch that match. It's a great match. Plus, Becky... You know, she tried so hard not to act like a babyface in that match. You could tell it was kind of hard for Becky to be a heel. Because she was so used to being a babyface. And the fans cheered her as a babyface that she tried so hard to try to stay as a heel. But everyone knew there was no way WWE was going to be able to keep the fans from not cheering Becky. Becky could have murdered Charlotte. And they, the fans were going to still cheer her. On, if we're being honest with ourselves. But there was nothing Becky could do to get booed. I think about that promo Becky cut, right, when she first turned heel. And she tried shitting on the fans, and the fans were having none of it. They booed her for, like, two seconds, and they went right back to chilling for her. Like, there was no way Becky was not going to be a babyface. And they had no choice but to turn her babyface a couple months later, right? Becky goes on to have that great last woman standing match with Charlotte at Evolution, what you could make an argument is Becky's greatest match ever, even though personally for me, I think it's Becky versus Sasha from Money in the Bank, or not Money in the Bank, from Hell in a Cell 2019, but it's subjective. They're both great matches. As much as I hate to give Charlotte credit, that match with Becky at Evolution is a fantastic match. Fantastic last woman standing match. Right. So, you know, Becky also uh, had the attack on Ronda Rousey where, you know, after SmackDown takes Raw under siege, Becky attacks Ronda Rousey backstage and we get that great image, that iconic image of Becky standing on the steps with her arms wide and her broken nose with the blood everywhere, right? Talking crap to Ronda. It's a great moment. It's a great moment. And those three months that, back, that Becky was champion were great. Even though we didn't get the Becky versus Ronda match that we should have got at Survivor Series because Nia broke Becky's face, still, we're eventually going to get that match and it should be worth the, the wait we've had to go through for the last two and a half years, waiting for the Becky and Ronda match we all want, right? But those three months that Becky was champion were really well. And plus, it ended in great fashion with that TLC you know, match where Oscar won the end of the year, where Ronda gets payback on Becky and Charlotte in the best fashion by costing them the SmackDown Women's Championship, setting the stage for what should have been Becky versus Ronda at WrestleMania 35, but the triple threat match. And of course, Becky's third reign, the short one, right? You know, we all remember it was more about the image of Becky at, in the main event of WrestleMania 35, holding both championships up in the air. Even though it's a disappointing match, it's a disappointing finish, really, because the finish comes out of nowhere. Uh, it's a great visual. It's a great visual, and it will always be remembered as the first women's main event in WrestleMania main in WrestleMania history. No matter, even though Sasha Bianca outclasses that match by by leagues, the margin is not even you know debatable, right? Uh, still, we're always going to remember that image of Becky holding up both the Raw and SmackDown Women's titles with all the pyro going behind her in the main event of WrestleMania 35. So because, you know, mainly because all three of Becky's reigns, or not reigns, all three of Becky's title victories are memorable, right? Plus her second reign is probably the most noticeable, 
the one that we think about the most because it was the beginning stages of the main character, right? Becky's going to get number three. She, in my opinion, she's the third greatest SmackDown Women's Champion of all time. And plus, she could go up if Becky comes back. And, you know, I don't know if Becky will be babyface or heel. WWE has a lot of things they can do with Becky. They can make her babyface continue with the man. They can make her heel. They can align her with Seth Rollins, her fiance. You know, there's a lot of cool things they can do with, with Becky. If Becky comes back and she's on SmackDown, she has a chance to, you know, eventually raise into number one or number two. But for right now, in my opinion, I have Becky as the third greatest uh, SmackDown Women's Champion of all time. All right. Next up at number two. So this is where it comes to, right? So if you just, you know, narrow it down, the only two people left here are Sasha Banks and Bayley. Who's the greatest SmackDown Women's Champion of all time, in my opinion? Guys, Sasha Banks is the second. Yes, I said it. Sasha Banks is the second greatest SmackDown Women's Champion of all time. If they had done what I said they should have done, if they had had Sasha... Have those matches with Chelsea Green, with Ruby Ride, with Liv Morgan, right? They had let her hold that title till SummerSlam, like I said they should have. If they had Sasha defend the title inside the Elimination Chamber, instead of wasting two pay-per-views going after the women's tag titles with Bianca Belair, I would probably, no question, put Sasha as the greatest SmackDown Women's Champion of all time. Sasha's, you know, Sasha's number two. She had a decent reign, even though the last month and a half is foggy because of WWE's bad booking of the Sasha Bianca storyline. You know, you look at the matches, those are what's going to be remembered from that reign. The matches with Bayley, the match with Asuka Survivor Series, the great match with Carmella, which I would tell you guys to go back and watch it. It's a great match from TLC. You know, even the, the title defense against Nia Jax on a random edition of SmackDown, it's a decent match because of how good Sasha is. And of course, how the reign ended at... WrestleMania with that fantastic main event with Bianca, what else is there to be said? You look at everybody else on this list, you compare their reigns to Sasha's reign, right? Sasha reigns is better. She had more iconic moments, more iconic matches, more things you're going to remember at the end of the day. And even though I wish Sasha would hold on to that title till SummerSlam, and I wish that we got more matches, like I've been saying throughout this video... Still, her being the second greatest SmackDown Women's Champion of all time, you know, is nothing to not be proud of. And remember, this is my list. It's subjective, right? And I still think, you know, regardless of Sasha being the second greatest SmackDown Women's Champion of all time, I still think she's the best female wrestler in the world and the best female uh, wrestler of all time, you know? But if we're talking in terms of the SmackDown Women's Championship, you know, Bayley is the greatest SmackDown Women's Champion of all time. And it's mainly because of her second reign. Not her first reign. Right? Both of Bailey's title victories are memorable. Her first title victory, of course. She was still a baby face. Remember, Sasha was on her four-month hiatus in 2019. Bailey wins the SmackDown Women's Championship. And uh, she cashes in the Money in the Bank briefcase. She wins the Money in the Bank match. And then cashes in on the same night. It's an iconic moment. It's a great moment. You know, I I remember Bailey uh celebrating with the fans in the crowd. It's a great moment, and everyone was happy to see Bailey get this big moment, especially after she was so poorly booked in the year prior, along with Sasha. Right? But Bailey's first reign as SmackDown Women's Champion is kind of, you know, not memorable. We don't remember anything from it. We only all we remember is her title victory. Everything else is not memorable. <laughs> They had her, I, I believe, at like stomping grounds, right? I don't know if you guys remember that pay per view. They had her go up against, uh, they had her go up against Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross in a handicap match, I believe, when Alexa was still heel at the time. No one remembers that. They teased a uh, Bailey versus, or no, they gave us Bailey versus Ember Moon at SummerSlam. That match was a heavy disappointment. And I'm just like, this is what we're doing? Yo, so I was like, dang, they're pushing Bailey, and then you're just going to, you know, disappoint us with 
booking Bailey like that as the SmackDown Women's Champion, like, what, like, what are we doing here? What are we doing here? And then Bailey lost the title to Charlotte just because, just because they wanted Charlotte to be the you know the ten time women's champion, which pisses me off to this day because Charlotte doesn't deserve to be a ten time women's champion. She doesn't. She's overrated as all hell. But then afterwards, right afterwards, we get that's when Bailey really fires up. Bailey becomes a heel five days later. Right, she destroys the inflatables. She comes up with new gear, new music. She cuts her hair, and then she beats Charlotte for the SmackDown Women's title. And it's a great moment. We all remember Bailey saying, "Screw you guys," right? And then she goes on for the next year, and she's a dominant champion. She has good matches with Naomi, freaking Lacey Evans, Nikki Cross, uh, Oscar, Sasha Banks. Excuse me. It's a great reign. It's a great reign. She's dominant. She's fantastic as a heel. As the reign goes on, right, Bailey becomes more and more comfortable being a heel. Because remember, Bailey had been a babyface all throughout that run. For all those years in NXT and through her first couple years in the main roster, Bailey had always been a babyface. The lovable, huggable Bailey, right? Could do no wrong, nothing. But then she turns heel, and she slowly, slowly gets more comfortable in that character, and she just becomes better and better and better on the mic with her character in the ring, and she just elevates herself. Plus, right, the storyline with Sasha Banks, because we all knew Sasha was going to be the one to take that towel from Bailey. We all knew it was happening, no matter what. And then, even though that was the case, we didn't know when it was going to happen, right, Still, they did a great job of telling a fantastic story, especially once the pandemic hit. Because once the pandemic hit, if you look at the pandemic era, Sasha and Bayley are the MVPs for that era. They were on all three shows as the women's tag team champions, right? Bayley, Bayley dough straps. You know, you have this, uh, the story with Sasha and Bayley as the tension slowly mounted between them, right? They they put on great matches with everybody they faced. No matter if it was Oscar and Kyrie Sane, you know Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross, friggin' Tegan Knox and Sachi Blackheart. It didn't matter. It was a great match. No matter where they went, their storyline was top priority. Everything that they did was interesting, and we were invested into it because of the greatness of Sasha and Bailey. And then once Bailey turns on Sasha, and then we get the match at Hell in a Cell. It's a great way to end Bailey's one year as champion. As predictable as it was, you know, it's they still did a great job with the story. And even like I said earlier, we can complain, you know, wishing that that match was saved for WrestleMania. It's still a fantastic story and a fantastic match at the end of the day that will be long remembered. So because of how great ba- Bailey's character growth was during her one year as champion and how dominant she was and the storyline she did with Sansa Banks, in my opinion... Bailey is the greatest SmackDown Women's Champion of all time. It's not Sasha Banks like many of you guys were probably thinking. But that's why you guys got to watch the whole video. I could easily just said at the beginning of the video and then be done with it. But no. You know, Sasha Banks is the second greatest SmackDown Women's Champion of all time in my opinion. So let me give the top 10 one more time. Bianca Belair is at number 10 with an asterisk because she's currently in her first reign as the title holder. So we can't. it wouldn't be fair to say... Or put Bianca anywhere on this list when she's so early in her reign. So maybe we'll come back to this when Bianca eventually loses that title to, to Sasha or Becky or whoever. So at number nine, I had Natalia. Number eight, I had Carmella. Number seven, I had Alexa Bliss. Number six, I had Naomi. Number five, I had Asuka. Number four, I had Charlotte. Number three, I had Becky. Number two, I had Sasha. And number one, I have Bailey. That is my list of the greatest SmackDown Women's Champions of all time. Let me know in the comment section what you guys think. So, yeah, that's about it. I'm surprised that we went over an hour, but like I said, I could talk forever. You guys know this about me. But let me know what you guys think. Where does Sasha rank in your list? Do you guys think Sasha is the greatest SmackDown Women's Champion? And if you guys think that, give me your opinion and your own list. And let's talk about it in the comment section down below. Sasha was a great SmackDown Women's Champion, right? But they could have done better. 
They could have done better. And if they had done some of the things that I said earlier, she could have been number one. You know, and maybe she will be number one because I do think Sasha will have a second reign to smack the women's champion. I don't know if she'll be babyface or heel. I don't know when she'll win the title. It could be at Money in the Bank this year. It could be at SummerSlam. It could be at WrestleMania next year. We don't know. But I do think Sasha will have another reign to smack the women's champion. And maybe at that point, you know, then I'll put her above Bailey for the number one spot as being the greatest smack the women's champion of all time in, in my eyes. But... For right now, uh, she's at number two. But uh, let me know what you guys think in the comments section, right? I'm going to get out of here. Hopefully, you guys enjoyed this long bonus episode of the Legitsu Podcast. And if you guys did, leave me, do me a favor and leave a like on this video. If you guys are new to the channel, hit the big red button. Subscribe. Also, hit the bell right next to my name, Fitzpunk TV. So you guys are notified every time I post a new video. You know, I post Raw, SmackDown, uh, pay-per-view reviews. All that good stuff. And we cover, of course, major stories. Make sure also to follow me down on social media if you want to talk wrestling, anime, any of that good stuff. But other than that, guys, that is all. I'm going to get out of here. You guys stay safe and healthy, y'all. Peace.